By the time of Watergate, I had been through the mill. As managing editor of a supplementary news service, the market value of better reported and written story became perfectly clear. As foreign editor, the challenge was to manage distant uh, but uh, experienced correspondents with varied needs, uh, as Mike so painfully pointed out. As Metro editor, it was handling many reporters early in their careers. I found that it was okay to be demanding, or as it has been known in the trade, hard on staff, if at the same time you are fair and do not adopt a petting zoo from among the people you are charged to lead. I had come to understand that everyone even the most attentive, the hardest working, the best intention, makes mistakes. And I had learned that I made more than enough of them myself. So as a starter, you had to be hard on yourself in order to be demanding of others. What helped take me into journalism and not into trade was rooted in my childhood. The stereotypes the Nazis inculcated that Jews were only good at business made me shy from it. More than anything, I wanted to do something of public service. Journalism struck me early on, before I graduated high school, as the best way for me to do that. The kind of newspaper man I became, whether or not I was aware of it at the time, certainly was shaped by my childhood experience. The more I looked back with my old man's eyes, the clearer it became to me that while it was not faded, it was no accident that I was attracted to journalism. For the essence of American democracy, for all aspiring to democracy, is a free press to hold to account the accountable, especially when there is no other entity that will do so. When Watergate broke, I did not have lofty thoughts, not one. What I had was an unusual and self-evidently important story for my local staff to do. In Washington and at the Post, the most important story was national politics. Its institutions, the Congress, the presidency, the courts, and government agencies, and the personages that ran them. They were covered by the national staff that consisted of veteran reporters, many renowned, some Pulitzer Prize winners. In the ordained world of journalism, a story of the scope of what Watergate became automatically would be slotted for the national staff's inbox. But then Watergate began as a burglary in the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee in the high rent Watergate complex. And burglaries are the stuff and trade for the local news operation known at the post as the Metropolitan Desk. The thoroughness of our reporting uncovered the scandal, peeling back layer after layer. Very quickly, it fell to one of our hardest working reporters, Bob Woodward, to take the lead. It was somewhat more surprising that Carl Bernstein turned out to be his partner, as together they relentlessly pursued the story that the Nixon administration was taking extraordinary and illegal means to cover up. I say surprising, not because Carl was not a good reporter. He was bright, but his work habits were sloppy. <laughs> he, in Watergate, he pulled himself together and justly shared in every accolade that has come to them both. Early on, we came to call them Woodstein. Both were good thinkers, Carl the more audacious and hasty, 
Bob the more careful and slower to jump to conclusions. One of the strengths they brought to the assignment was their dedication. They worked very hard and all hours and all days. They surely quickly recognized that they had a big story in their hands. As the days passed, the story's epic legs emerged. It wasn't going away as it steadily implicated the higher echelons of the Nixon administration. An apparent weakness shared by their Metro editors was likely an advantage. The lack of insider knowledge about official and political Washington. Woodstein had to go find out for themselves and did so by connecting to clerks, assistants, secretaries who attended the powerful persons in the Nixon campaign organization and the lobbyists and consultants who serviced it. Much of their reporting was based on confidential sources, people who saw and heard but were reluctant or afraid to speak out. The president's minions were ace players of hardball. Frequently, it took lengthy persuasion. Carl was especially skilled keeping an interview going long after the person wanted to stop. As our reporting progressed, it became increasingly incumbent for me to be extraordinarily vigilant. I had to make doubly sure that what we put into the paper was solid. I fully understood that the fate of the Washington Post rested on it. So did my job. Were we wrong, it would alienate the public and diminish the gains and prestige that already had been achieved. In addition, the Post recently had gone public and Wall Street was ever wary about the federal government messing with its interests. The Post also owned federally licensed television stations. Those licenses were threatened by the Nixon cohort. In the immortal words of that great public servant, John Mitchell, the Republicans were going to do a number on us to keep us on the right side. It was imperative that we adhered to the demands of traditional hard reporting, forsaking the highly personal point of view approach that was the hallmark of the new journalism, a force in media since the preceding decade. During that time, the word objective lost respect indeed was widely regarded as a pejorative because it was viewed as an obstacle to getting at the real truth. It is a given that perfect objectivity is no more attainable than perfect justice. That doesn't mean that the courts and the processes of justice should be abandoned. It does mean they should be reformed. They remain the bedrock of our democracy. And so I argue, objectivity is to journalism. Necessary despite its imperfections, a part of the very same foundation. Objectivity does not require reporters to be neutered. They have, and they should have, ideas, preferences, biases, points of view, that are the product of the social culture out of which they emanate. What they must also have is awareness of those predispositions lest they undermine their work. Watergate has legacies. In the media, the use of confidential sources and their very mystique ranks high widespread reliance on them by the Washington Post in Watergate excited a constant drumbeat of criticism. But Watergate proved that the careful use of confidential inform informants was in the first place essential to unlock illegal activities. 
It has to be kept in mind that unnamed in print does not mean unknown. With one major exception I will get to later, in Watergate, editors knew who they were. For another, we frequently had more than one source. Common sense tells you two sources are better than one, and three are better than two. But in truth, confidential sources are a tricky business. They often, if not always, have a personal agenda and don't offer their insider's knowledge because they are pure idealists wanting only to right wrongs. So it was necessary to have reporters find out if the source had direct knowledge, was present at the crucial discussion, if the source has been told, then by whom, and in what circumstances. What self-interest was being promoted? This helped us to evaluate. I stress that I didn't expect confidential sources to be virgins. If they plowed a furrow, then we needed to take that into account. By itself, it did not invalidate what they had to say. It helped enormously if there was a document or a tape to help support the information. There were a couple of illegitimate offspring of Watergate. One was the proliferation of unnamed sources throughout the American media. Few were held to the strict standards that we imposed, and so they led to a multitude of source stories that collapsed from a lack of accuracy. The other undesirable legacy was the enshrinement of two sources as an infallible guarantee of accuracy. It started with Woodstein. In the early stages of their collaboration, when Bob and Carl were not that sure of each other, both tried to match the other source so as not to be outdone. So we double sourced a lot of information. In time, Executive Editor Ben Bradley came to see it as a prophylactic against error and convenient to reassure an occasionally nervous Catherine Graham, the publisher, who asked, how do we know we're right? Of course, multiple sources are likely better, but not categorically. One source can be right, and many sources can be wrong. It depends on the validity of the information, not the number of sources. Now to the glaring exception that proves the rule. Where my practice had been to know every source's name and more, the one deviation was deep throat. There came a point when I invited Woodward to enter my office, closed the door, and asked him to identify the man that frequently figured in our discussions. He looked down, he paused before he answered, and then he told me he would do so if I insisted. He warned that I should know that he had given his word that he, Bob, would never reveal his name and that doing so might endanger the man's career or even more. I considered Woodward's response quickly concluded that it was best to leave matters as they were. I was sure that the Nixon Justice Department would summon us to testify under oath. I knew Woodward would never tell and thus face incarceration. I knew I would not tell, and I decided that under that circumstance, many of us as possible remain free to pursue our investigation. It was only years later that I came to understand I should have insisted. At least one other person besides the reporter, more would be better, needs to know how to validate the reporter's judgment and to protect the interest of the newspaper. 
But I pray that the most enduring legacy of Watergate remains the importance, no, the indispensability of investigative journalism to our democratic society. The free and constitutionally enabled press exists to take on the challenges of corrupt or worse, repressive government. The three branches that govern the United States did not succeed in dealing with the crisis of Watergate until they were informed and goaded by the press to face up to their responsibilities. Congress was tied up in its own self-protective machinations. The courts were on the fringes until a case was brought to them. And even then, government prosecutors pulled their punches. The executive was committing the crimes, deploying its police forces to cover up and unleashing its great powers to thwart the press for a long time, mostly the Washington Post. In the wake of Watergate, the Congress and the presidency bestirred themselves to enact laws intended to prevent a recurrence of the abuses of the Nixon administration. As many reforms, they had a shelf life that wasn't all that long. The special prosecutor, crucial to unraveling the Nixon conspiracy, turned out to be a runaway instrument of political headhunting during the Clinton administration. The financial reporting reforms intended to thwart the use of political contributions for illegal purposes gave way to the political parties wanting that money more. The Supreme Court made matters worse when it ruled that money was free speech, defying the logic that speech is speech and money is money. Limitations placed on domestic intelligence operations, including congressional oversight, enactment of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and the ban on political assassinations, all sundered in the aftermath of 9-11, if not before. Considering the impact Watergate had on the nation, and specifically the standards that it set for journalism, it is vital to identify the requisite component at the heart of this exemplary enterprise. It was Catherine Graham, the publisher and owner. The attribute on which groundbreaking journalism depends is an owner or the key responsible figure willing to risk prosperity on behalf of fearless journalism, as she did, even though her financial advisors and lawyers argued against it. This is not a slight matter, as we all know. Newspapers are a business and they need to make money. But that necessity can too easily shape the kind of journalism pervade to avoid rocking the boat, instead courting the powers that be while pandering and sensationalizing to titillate the inconstant customer. In the present day, the challenge to pursue excellent journalism is magnified when the business model for even quality newspapers is under relentless threat as readers and advertisers vanish. As an old newspaper man, my preference abides with the printed word on paper. But as an old newspaper man looking over the array of technological inventions that seemingly expand by the day, I say with an open heart that the format does not count for as much as the content. The printed word may be diminished or even, God forbid, disappear. Blog and Twitter away as much as you please, but make it about matters that have been carefully reported scan it on whatever device can convey it. My overriding concern 
is that in the future, reliable work shall not be swamped by outpourings of suspicions, feelings, and ideologies unsupported by the factual reporting that the people require if our democracy is to thrive. Getting that right is the big challenge for our nation that is not ever going to go away. I thank you for your attention, and I welcome your questions.